Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live Special number 289, recorded June 1st, 2016. Augmented World Expo 2016. This Twit Live Special is brought to you by Tracker. Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. Pair Tracker to your smartphone, attach it to any item, and find its precise location with the tap of a button. Visit thetracker.com right now to take advantage of their Father's Day limited time sale through June 13 only, and enter promo code TWIT for a free color upgrade. The Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, and yes, the PlayStation VR have shown us what good VR looks like. You can now create an immersive world filled with beautiful 3D objects. But to a select group of developers, educators, and enterprise folk, there is something better than VR. And that's why we're here at AWE, the Augmented World Expo, to take a look at the latest and greatest in augmented reality. To the people here, to the people who see AR as the future, playtime is over. If you think you know what augmented reality is, no, you don't. We're here with Alex, who's going to explain why Torch is the next generation of interactive game. Alex, this is a sandbox, but it's also a video game. Tell me what I'm looking at. Yeah, so what you're looking at is Torch. It's our interpretive projector system. And so it allows us to do interactive sandbox as well as interactive tabletop gaming and experiences. So right now we're looking at Super Tanked. It's a two to four player arcade style tank battle where players build their battlefield using the sand. The higher they are in Hiller Mountain, the farther they can shoot. Oh, it, it seems like an interesting application. Now, I just played it, and so what you do is you can actually change the sand with your hands, or real-world hands, to change the, the environment inside the game, and that will just de then determine how your tank travels over terrain. Uh, people may look at this and say, okay, it's a video game, but what I'm most interested in is the fact that you use Intel's RealSense camera to be able to detect what has happened to the sand, and then it uses that data to build the virtual environment. What other applications might we have for this kind of technology? Well, it's dynamic world building using real world sand. So we currently use it with the military to do mission planning. They're able to project down a map and over, you know, build up their sand to that map. We're also looking into education. So things like uh, geology, where you could teach kids about you know, different layers in the rock, or biology, where you build a world for animals to migrate around. So we're looking at different things like that. Um, and then also with uh, flat tabletop surfaces, we're looking into restaurants and bars to project down a menu. You order your drinks and your food, and then while you wait, you play air hockey. Oh, of course, that, that is one level, but what I really love is the fact that in both VR and AR, there has always been the idea of the, being able to manipulate something, but the problem has been you're not actually manipulating anything. You might be moving a cursor, moving a pointer. If you can have a real sense camera or a similar technology actually detect what you've done to an object, and then it can automatically take that information and build the 3D model based on it, it, it opens up not just display options, but uh, you know architectural options. Exactly. I mean, what we're looking to do is by using a projector, by using and you know, 3D depth camera, we're able to change the actual object the way it looks, to project a new image on top and dynamically do that in real time without wearables, without holding an iPad in front of you. We're actually changing the real thing. Alex, this is very cool. Now, if they want to find out more about Torch, if they want to find out more about your company, more about where maybe they might be able to actually get their hands on one of these, where can they go? Yeah, so if you want to find out more about it, go to www.experiencetorch.com. Alex, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you for sharing your tech. And folks, if you want to play with augmented reality, try Torched, because it's lit. One of the promises of augmented reality is that it allows us to better our skills without destroying things in the real world. But what does it do for welding? I'm here with Pedro from Seabury, who's going to explain why AR is a, a welder's best friend. Now, Pedro, any of our audience members who have ever tried to TIG or MIG welding knows that it's all about angle, it's all about speed, it's all about consistency. But practicing on real steel, on real metals, is often very frustrating. 
you and Seabury have come up with a better way. Explain. Right. Well, actually, uh, you're, you're right. So one of the great values of this is that uh, students that would need to learn how to weld, they're frustrated when they're welding a welding piece, and then they see their results, and they don't know how they did in the, in the, in the exercise. Now, with this product, not only you can see as you're welding, uh, you, the system will give you actually feedback on how you're doing in terms of the skills, the, the, the art length, the travel angle, etc. But also, you can see after you do the exercise, replay the, the entire thing at any time, and review that with an instructor and see how you need to improve. Now, it's, we have this product in, in, in 45 countries so all over the, the, the world and in, 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 in training schools. The great thing is it saves about 50% of the consumables. So, you know, you have a great saving for the schools. So the actually schools can bring more students into the class because one of the biggest problems for welding in school is the cost. It's very expensive. Now, you also can attract new, newer generations that are intimidated and frustrated by real welding. Once they learn how to do the basics of welding, then they can go to the booth. This doesn't replace the welding booth, but it's really enhanced the whole process of training. And that, that's really, that was our goal and motivation from the beginning. And I mean, the market is, uh, is telling us, that I guess we were right in that sort of hinge of utilizing augmented reality for this specific application. There are other systems that use virtual reality. Augmented reality is better, and I'll tell you why. Because in welding, you need to touch the piece. So when you have this piece in your hand, you can actually, and welding, you can do this in augmented reality. You cannot do that with virtual. In virtual, you are completing a virtual world. Augmented, you are in this world, but when you see this piece, it becomes carbon and steel. So uh, we found that augmented is really a better technology for, for welding training. And, um, uh, you know, as we said before, the, you know, we have a lot of advantages versus traditional welding training. So. Oh, what I really love about this is the fact that I've got, uh, I've got that helmet. So I've got a welder's mask on. I've got something that looks like the actual TIG or MIG welding tool. And um, I, as you said, I can touch it. But it's not just being graded. It's not just having an instructor come over and say, that was a good job, that was a bad job. Here are a few things you can try. You can actually replay your entire welding lesson, and it will tell you your angle was wrong, or your arc length was off, or or you went too fast or too or too slowly, or you burned through the material here. That kind of feedback after the fact, that gets me excited. Where do you see this kind of technology used next? Because I think it has an incredible future in training, but uh, what's after welding? We are at an augmented reality, uh, uh, really a training company and there's a lot of application. The key is every single sort of trade that you, where you need to use manual skills. Think about, for example, healthcare. There's a lot of application in healthcare. This is actually a welder, have a lot of the same skills as a surgeon. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, possibilities there. That's a big area of growth, probably for the whole industry. And I think uh, medical students all around the world will thank you for not having to operate on cadavers to find all the pieces of the body. Uh, Pedro, if they wanted to find out more about this technology, more about Seabury, where can they go? Well, uh, Seabury, uh, Seabury, we're actually a company based in Spain, Seabury.es, and the product, Soldamatic, is soldamatic.com. Uh, you can just get information uh, there, and we sell all over the world, really. So, uh, you know, you guys are welcome to try. One of the hidden stories of the VRAR expansion has been Leap Motion. Now I'm here with Martin who's going to explain why Leap thinks they've got the secret sauce to make the combination of AR and VR complete. Martin, what is Leap Motion? So Leap Motion is hand tracking. Basically we, we're trying to break down the barrier between people and virtual reality or augmented reality and let them interact naturally with virtual objects. Now, there's a reason why this is big, because we could look at a product like the HTC Vive, which has the paddles, or we could look at the Oculus Rift, which you really need a controller, and same thing with the PlayStation. The ability to actually use your hand as a controller adds a whole new dimension, but it's been tried, and I have to say, most of the results have been iffy. What have you done to make hand tracking actually doable? Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a really hard problem, and we've been doing it for a while. Um, actually, our co-founders have been doing it for going on six, seven, eight years now, um, and it's taken a long time to get to the point that we're at right now. But uh, 
there's definitely a point where it just works and I think we're pretty much at that point now. So uh, all the feedback that we've been getting over the last uh, few months, especially since uh, our release of Orion, which is basically our virtual reality specific hand tracking um, technology, uh, that has been getting basically rave reviews. So once everybody's sort of on board, you know that we're at a point where it's, it's, it's there. I don't want you to, to divulge any company secrets here, but what is it about hand tracking that becomes so hard? Because I've seen even great demos turn into a thing where my hand starts jumping around the screen because it loses it. Why is that? Why is it so difficult for any sensor to figure out where my hands are positioned? Um, so hands are a really complicated um, mechanism. You've got uh, our tracking uh, takes your hand as 27 different data points and each of those data points has an orientation and a position um, and when you add on top of that that uh, any sensor that's mounted to the headset is only looking at your hands from one perspective if you have your hands like this or like this that's pretty easy but if you have your hands like this or like this and the sensor can't even see your fingers and it has to sort of take the data that it's given and figure it out hundreds of times a second uh, that's where you get edge cases where hands might fly away or do, or do something strange. So uh, working on those edge cases is the hardest part, and that's what we've been working on for a while now. now speaking of edge cases, right behind us there's a, a man who's doing the demonstration at this very moment. And we can see that he's, he's actually manipulating the, the items, the blocks on the screen, with, with incredible dexterity. And, uh, you know, as, as he's curling his hands around these blocks to pick them up, it falls into that edge case where the sensor is going to lose track of the fingers for just a moment. So what is it doing there? What, what have you written that allows it to guess so accurately about the placement of his fingers? Uh, yeah, so um, this demo right here is uh, it's called Blocks, and it's basically a showcase not only of hand tracking, which is a difficult problem in itself uh, with the occlusion issues and everything else I just mentioned, um, but once you have really accurate hand tracking, uh, the next step is that people want to manipulate, ob manipulate virtual objects the same way they manipulate real objects. And in the real world, you have a lot of things that tell you, for instance, when you have grabbed something, you've got the feedback. You, you stop closing your hand, and you know that it's in your hand. With virtual objects, you don't have that. Um, and so they're are all these strange interaction design problems of, okay, what happens if you close your hand entirely through a block? Uh, game physics engines aren't used to having that sort of a, a problem with an unstoppable force coming into contact with the collider. Um, so in blocks, we've come up with our own uh, sort of middleware physics layer in, uh, in Unity, um, which we're calling the interaction engine, which tries to figure out, okay, if your hand is holding a block and your other hand is holding a block and you push those two blocks together until they're in the same space, how can we resolve that in a way that is consistent with the world but is also intuitive and reacts in a way that you would expect. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of design challenges and a lot of new uh, sort of ground that we're figuring out as we go. Martin, I'm hoping that we see this technology in more and more products as we go along. Uh, if they wanted to find out more about Leap Motion, more about what you're doing here, or maybe to find a demo of their own, perhaps order a dev kit, where can they go? Uh, so you can go to leapmotion.com. If you're a developer, developer.leapmotion.com. Um, we've got tons of documentation. We've got integration for Unity, Unreal, um, JavaScript, Internet of Things, basically anything you could want to use your hands to control. Uh, we've got somebody that's probably tried it and has uh, an experience to share. So uh, leapmotion.com and developer.leapmotion.com. One of the strengths of augmented reality is the ability to take something in the real world and to turn it into something else. Like, for example, this is an eye. I'm speaking with Brian Yetzer of Yetzer Studios who's going to explain how their software uses some off-the-shelf suites to uh, turn this into a real eye. Brian, what is this? This is how the human eye works, but you would never know from looking at that without downloading the free app called ARI. All right, so show me how this works. I've got Something that's it's not a QR code, but obviously it can be recognized by your hardware and software combination. And what is it going to do? Well, I guess to best explain what it does is to just hold it up to the graphic. And in this case, you see that we have an, a 3D model that is interactive. So you can select the different parts of the eye to get more information about it but you can also play back an animation that'll simulate how light transfers from this eye chart to throughout the eye itself. So there's an additional mode called Go to Simulator where you'll be able to simulate different eye diseases. 
all using uh, Vuforia uh, technology. Now, you've got Vuforia technology here, and I believe your rendering engine is Unity. Uh, tell me, why, why would you make something like this? What's, what's the idea of making a, a learning instrument that could guide me through different eye diseases and eye problems? Uh, obviously, it's much more interactive for uh, students, uh, for kids and adults alike to learn about health and science using mobile technology now that uh, a majority of us have mobile uh, uh, phones and tablets. So you get to take command of the actual device and experience it in, in as many, in, in different angles, interactively. And uh, it's more of an experience in that sense as opposed to just having static imagery as we're used to in the 20th century, let's say. Where do you want to grow this technology? Is the idea to have a classroom filled with different stations that students can use, either a tablet or some other AR device, to come up and, and do their lesson of the day? Or, or is there more of a, a, a sort of a concentrated effort to make an AR classroom? Well, that's a very good question. I, I believe at this moment just harnessing the ability that, uh, to take advantage of uh, everyone's de devices that are on hand is powerful but as far as like future tech and uh, how it'll be implemented in the classroom is to be seen i'm not sure we're yet we're there yet with the uh the the eyewear but i believe that it'll somehow merge with our mobile devices so eyewear and mobile devices will merge to make it a little bit more of a seamless experience especially for the the younger children uh because of course this it's got to be somewhat um, uh, portable and durable and uh, seamless for the, uh, to have them experience it uh, in, in its entirety without technology in the way. Well, let's get really geeky. Our audience is, is pretty well well versed in technology. Obviously, you've got the Unity en engine doing the, the rendering, but what is Vuforia doing for you? You're here at the booth. What does their suite allow our audience to create? Well, I believe that uh, for us, we've been uh, using primarily image tracking, and so uh, Vuforia is Ex is excellent with image tracking and it integrates very 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 well with unity so a kind of a combination of the two it's a no-brainer Brian, thank you very much for sharing your your tech and your time with us if they wanted to find out more about your studio more about Vuforia where can they go yet sir studio.com we'll get back to all the augmented goodness in just a little while but first let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the sponsor of this twit live special tracker. Now, if you're like me, you've got a lot of gadgets that travel with you, from your smartphone to your keys to even your car. But losing things can make smart people not feel so smart, which is why Tracker helps you to find all your smart devices. A Tracker is a coin-sized device that locates misplaced keys, wallets, bags, computers, pretty much anything in seconds. You just pair the Tracker to your smartphone, attach it to anything, anything that you're afraid of losing, and find its precise location with the tap of a button. It's really that easy. Now, you can customize two-way separation alerts to receive notifications before you leave your item behind. Have you ever been at a coffee store and you've accidentally let your laptop or your phone or, or a purse on a chair as you start to walk away? Well, with Tracker and your, and your customizable alerts, you can have your phone tell you, hey, look, don't leave me here. Or you could say, hey, it's, you're leaving your purse. Or you could have it say, you're getting too far away from your car. Pretty much any way you can imagine using a location device is how you can use Tracker. Lose your phone, press the, the button on your tracker, and the paired phone will ring, so it works both ways. Now, with over 1.5 million devices, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world. The Tracker app records your lost item's last known location on a map, so if you need to backtrack, you know exactly where you need to go. Tracker has also partnered with leading companies like HP, allowing companies to build trackable products that utilize the scale of Tracker's crowd GPS network, but built in to the device that you just bought. Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth Low Energy, so it's not going to sap your battery. And you can also purchase a water-resistant case if you're going to be taking your devices into hostile environments. Don't you think it's time to make your smart devices even smarter? Never lose anything again with the tracker. In fact, the hardest thing to find is their website. That's thetracker.com. Don't miss this Father's Day limited time sale through June 13 only. Buy two devices and get two free. Plus, just for our audience, enter the promo code TWIT and you'll get a free color upgrade. That's the tracker. T H E T R A C K R.com. 
promo code TWIT. And we thank Tracker for their support of this TWIT live special. There's a temptation to think of AR and VR as nothing but fun and games, but here at Vuforia, they've got something else in mind, something for the enterprise. I'm speaking with Jay Wright, who's going to explain what Vuforia is doing for the AR experience in big business. Jay, what is this, what is Vuforia doing with a big cat in its booth? Well, this is a Caterpillar skid steer. And what we have done is take step-by-step -step instructions that show a service person how to execute a simple service procedure and put them directly on top of the machinery itself. And before is a software platform that makes this very easy for developers to do. So what you'll see here is we've built an application that does this, that works on multiple types of devices, whether handheld or on your head, including HoloLens, Microsoft Surface, iPad, or the ODG R7. Now that is important because that is the democratization of AR. That is the ability to take something and not just use it on one product, not just the HoloLens, not just the Vive, not just a Surface, but pretty much every device you have being able to get some information from the AR suite. How do you do that? Well, we solve the really hard computer vision problems. So you can think about Vuforia as a digital eye that is put inside the application and tells the application what it sees and where. And then it's up to the developer to use that information to build the experience on top. So we've really focused on making that digital eye work very, very robustly in a variety of different environments and with a variety of different objects so that these experiences can be deployed on a multitude of devices. Let's talk to our enterprise audience members because there is a temptation to, to look at AR and think, oh, Google Glass, it fizzled out. Whereas most of us in the enterprise were saying, no, you just you sold it to the wrong crowd. Right. The consumer will see AR and they'll see a gadget. People in the enterprise have been saying forever, hey, look, give me a product that would allow me to walk into a colo yeah. and immediately know exactly what every piece of equipment is, right. what are the access credentials, and what it should be connected to. Right. And that, that is hours and days off of my work schedule. Yes. Is, is that what Vuforia enables? And, and if so, how much further can I go? Where do you see this, this ability to take apart and explode it be, uh, leading to in the next two, three years. Look, I'll tell you, if you are doing your job today in enterprise and you are at some point referring to 3D information that is on the printed page, I don't care if it's a blueprint, a schematic for a building, or a huge instruction manual, that will go away. In, in five years, if you are not wearing or holding some kind of device to do that with AR, you will be asking your boss for one. And that's, that's what we're really hoping for because I think the people in the enterprise have seen the value of a product like this for a long time. We just, we haven't figured out a really good way to, to do development. So let's actually talk about that. Let's say I've got an audience member and he or she wants to do a little bit of development for, for a HoloLens and its use in uh, automotive repair. What would be the process of them using the Vaforia suite to develop software that could then be run on that HoloLens, an iPad, a Surface, whatever they might have? So look, our mission is to democratize AR, and we want to do that for people with all range of skill sets. And what you'll see in the platform today is tremendous flexibility for people that know how to write code. So they can use something like Unity or Xcode or Android Studio or Microsoft, or Microsoft Visual Studio to build those applications. Where we're going, and we showed a little bit of this this morning, is based on this concept we call ThingX. And ThingX is an authoring tool, not for people who write code, but for people who can author experiences and know how to work with 3D assets. We want to make it extremely simple to unlock the 3D assets you already have, take those step-by-step -step instructions, and put them in AR, where we can put them in front of people's eyes to make their jobs way more fun and way more productive. All right, Jay, I think the only thing that's left is to tell our audience where they can find Vuforia, where they could find more information about developing with Vuforia, and um, perhaps show them a couple of demos. Where can they go? Absolutely. They should visit developer.vuforia.com. Everything they need to get started, right there. What if I told you that right now you could download a tool, an open source tool that would allow you to start AR development at this very moment? Well, that's exactly what you could do here at Daiquiri. I'm speaking with Ben Vaughn, who's going to explain why they've open sourced the AR toolkit. Ben, what is the AR toolkit? Okay, it's a, um, it's a software developer's kit that allows people to create augmented reality environments very easily using tools they're probably familiar with, like Unity, for example, or Unreal for another. Um, the software runs on literally every platform, iOS, uh, Android, 
Windows, Mac, Linux. So whatever you're used to using, you can use it with our software. We've seen some very interesting demonstrations of the technology behind us. Everything from AR-assisted hobby uh, tools to a very interesting magazine-type device. But why would you open source it? Why take a tool that is fantastic and make it free? Well, we, we believe that uh, for a small industry to grow quickly, such as the AR industry, we need to try and lower the barriers to entry as far as we can. By giving away or open sourcing our software, we think we'll encourage people to come into the industry and at a much lower cost than they would otherwise have to be. Now let's talk about that barrier to entry because there is a, a, uh, well, a conceived barrier, and that is people think it's too difficult to program. It's too difficult to, to create an AR app. Even if they are programmers right now, it's, it feels like a big jump. If they wanted to make that jump, how would they use the AR toolkit to do it? In other words, what would the process be for one of our audience members to take something that they've done and AR enable it? Well, let, let's just say that they've um, developed an application using Unity. That's a good example, right? Uh, they go to artoolkit.org, download AR Toolkit for Unity. They run through the examples. They look at the examples, and three minutes later, they're, going, they're up and running. It really is that simple. One of the reasons why we stopped by Daiquiri is I love companies that are enabling others to develop. There are some wonderful vendors here who have made interesting solutions, but the fact that you want others to take your solution and do something unexpected with it, that gets me excited. Where would you like to see AR Toolkit be in a year from now? Would, do you want to see a lot of market share? Do you just want to see an encouragement of the AR field development? What's next for Daiquiri? Our interest is twofold. Yes, of course we want people to use our software. That is why we've open sourced it. But what we really want to see is innovation. Something interesting, be creative, go out there, think what you want to do and do it. That's it. Ben, thank you very much for your time. Now, if they wanted to find AR Toolkit, if they wanted to find Daiquiri, if they wanted to download the package for their rendering engine, where could they go? www.artoolkit.org. Watching VR and AR is magical, but for it to be truly magical, you need to feel it. That's why I'm speaking with Zach at Subpack, who's going to explain why you might be sitting or wearing your next AR VR experience. Zach, what is Subpack? So Subpack is a physical audio technology. In reality, we don't experience sound with just our ears. We experience it with our entire body. It's vibration. So in order to get a full reality experience virtually, you have to be able to feel audio. So what we do is we take low frequencies and we transmit them directly into the body. You can see behind me here, my friend Clark, who goes by Grimecraft, he works for a company called The Wave, which you can see over there, and they're doing a virtual music experience. It's kind of like tilt brush, but for music. So he's DJing a set right now and able to feel all of the frequencies in his body from the set with a simple plug and play technology. There's nothing binary involved. There's no middleware. There's no coding. It's pure audio energy. So you put, put just plug and play. So it's for the creator all the way to the consumer. So if you're designing a VR experience, if you're using a VR or AR experience, this is how you'll create those sounds because it allows you to go all the way down to 5 hertz, which is lower than you're able to hear. And then if you're using VR, you're getting that full body sensation. And when it comes to creation, there's no really pure reference right now because bass is physics. Bass waves are long. So in order to properly get those in your mix, it's very difficult. It depends on the shape of the room. Like right now you can hear his music playing. That sounds differently to the ear depending on where you are. This will be a pure reference no matter where you're on top of Mount Everest or you know in a cupboard under the stairs hanging out with Harry Potter. Uh, Zach... Uh, to be honest, we have seen products like this, uh, boom chairs and, and sound effect adding right. accessories, and we have not been impressed. But we had a chance to sit on the sub pack, and I got to say, you got something right. I mean, I can actually feel it, even if I can't hear it. What did you do? What's inside the technology that makes sub pack different? So before previously people have used tactile audio, and we don't, never will claim to have vended tactile audio, but we have perfected it because nobody else was doing it high fidelity. Before they were just taking transducers, putting them on your back, and it felt like, you know, uh, like a dwarf punching you in the kidneys. This actually is a perfect representation 
of bass frequencies. So by going to the music producers in the world, you know, Timbaland is a partner in the company, Richie Houghton is a partner in the company. By going and working with these music producers, we've been able to create a tool that actually represents the frequencies that they need to create music. So by making it a professional tool as well as a consumer tool has elevated it from, you know, what could have been just a simple toy to something that professionals use who are Grammy Award winners, all the way down to a kid in his bedroom playing Call of Duty. So what it does is instead of pushing air, we're pushing you. So in a speaker, you have a magnet and a cone, and the cone moves the air. This is the opposite. So we're pushing you instead of the air. You are the base cabinet, essentially. It's a much better approach because more of the energy gets transferred into the body. And it also means you've got a wearable device and you could actually be either DJing or walking down the street feeling it without actually hearing it, which, which I love. Exactly. And we do a lot of work with the deaf and hard of hearing community. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we do a lot of work with the deaf and hard of hearing community because they can't hear music, but they can definitely feel it. And one of our goals as a company is to reduce tinnitus because a lot of people go to a big show, go to a big club, and they're like, oh, my God, you know, that bass nectar show was amazing. I could Because you know, that visceral experience of feeling sound, and they go home and they put on their headphones and they turn it up to 11. All that's going to do is give you hearing loss and tinnitus. This actually allows you to turn the volume down but turn the bass up, which is better for you all around. Zach, where would you like to see this in the coming years? Because right now you, you, are, you are creating the experience off of the audio out. Right. Would you like to see more developers actually include the option for tactile vests and tactile accessories so that maybe you could get a separate channel to drive your technology? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're constantly iterating, and the easiest way for us to get this in front of people and get people using it wasn't to take a dictatory approach and say, this is the plugin you have to use, this is the special middleware, this is the different types of things you're going to have to do that are more complicated than what you're doing already. This allows you to do it now. And so we're taking a collaborative approach to VR and saying, what is it that you want in this product? We're always going to be able to do a plug and play, but do we want to isolate and make new ways of experiencing sound? Absolutely. All right, let's get to the brass tacks. If they wanted to try a sub pack today, I know you have two models. Give me pricing and availability, and then where can they go to find them? They can get them on www.thesubpack.com, the Seatback S2 is 299 and the wearable version is 349 that's the m2 and you can get them on our website and a bunch of different retailers uh that we list uh on our site zach thank you very much for speaking with us nice with you thank well. you for sharing your tech and if you are an ar or a vr fanatic and you want to feel it without submitting to dwarven kidney punching folk <laughs> you got to try sub back from the latest in development suites to sensors that can position our movement exactly to beautiful glasses that give us high resolution images. We've seen just a little bit of everything here at AWE 2016. Enough to show us the future, and the future is augmented. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit with Twit TV saying goodbye from Augmented World Expo 2016.